Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Um, talking to you on uh, a, a wide range of uh, topics uh, that span the field of endocrine surgery. I, I, since I'm uh, talking here to the uh, Clinical Endocrinology Conference, I didn't want to uh, attempt to talk specifically about uh, any one uh, uh, endocrinopathy this time. I wanted to uh, talk about something that uh, was unique to surgery. So uh, I figured uh, I would uh, review endocrine surgery uh, complications, um, which uh, is always dangerous to uh, talk to uh, or talk, talk about uh, when you're talking to the group of people who send you patients um, about all the bad things that can go wrong in the operations. But uh, uh, just to uh, go over for for everybody in the audience here, the uh, the range of complications that occur with uh, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal surgeries. Um, no disclosures. Um, so really, again, we're going to talk about the spectrum of complications. Uh, both mechanical as well as uh, hormonal complications that can arise from endocrine uh, operations. Um, and I use the term M&M, &M, uh, uh, one, because it had a nice uh, uh, ring to the uh, candy and it gave me uh, some uh, pictures to put throughout this talk. Um, but uh, for those who are not uh, as comfortable with it, it's morbidity and mortality. Other institutions call it uh, uh, death and complications. Um, and this is certainly something within the surgical world that is done on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, it's actually required by many of the uh, surgical um, uh, residency requirement uh, accrediting agencies uh, to be done on a uh, routine basis. It's for quality improvement. It's also for education. Um, and it's uh, something that is certainly steeped in surgical history. Um, uh, there's many uh, con uh, institutions whose conferences uh, were known that basically someone was often uh, uh, fired uh, during the M&M uh, conference and then rehired so they can go do clinical care in cases by the end of the uh, end of the conference because uh, they can get to be quite uh, contentious. Um, uh. So uh, what I put up on the slide here is uh, the verbiage that I have on my uh, consent for essentially all of the uh, related thyroid operations, whether it's thyroid lobectomy, a total thyroidectomy, um, and they get even a little bit more uh, in depth if we're adding uh, especially lateral neck dissections. Um, and uh, we'll go through some of these, but this is essentially what the patients are, are signing off on, um, uh, acknowledging. Certainly the, uh, the consent form itself uh, is a representation of the discussion that you have with the patient and in no way uh, um, means that if uh, one of these happen, if there was negligence, this uh, the signing of this form doesn't actually allow uh, uh, avoidance of any uh, litigation attempts by the patient. But um, you can see that there's a, a pretty scary range of uh, complications uh, uh, that we talk about up to and including uh, death. I'm not going to focus on that one during uh, this talk. I'll focus uh, on the more classic complications as far as uh, bleeding, um, as far as injury to surrounding structures such as the parathyroid glands uh, and the uh, uh, superior and inferior laryngeal nerves. Um, so it's cervical hematoma. This is one that we um, talk about during uh, any cervical endocrine operation, whether it's thyroid or parathyroid. Uh, and in essence, it is uh, acute. Um, venous or arterial bleeding uh, that happens uh, within the uh, operative bed uh, in, in the post-operative period. Um, uh, this can present in a very dramatic fashion um, uh, and become uh, quite scary for the patient as well as the providers. Um, it is uncommon, as you will see with really all of these uh, complications uh, that I'm going to describe, especially for the thyroid and the parathyroid operations, um, uh, the incidence is really less than about 1%. Um, and that's a, um, a reasonable number to remember, although depending upon the volume of the uh, surgery, uh, whether it's thyroid or parathyroid, that an individual provider uh, does, that those numbers can certainly change. Uh, but 1%, uh, if your patients are asking, is a, is a reasonable number to quote. So cervical hematomas often will present certain with swelling, um, and acute swelling in the neck 
uh, after an operation really has to be presumed to be a cervical hematoma until proven otherwise. Uh, there is not uh, going to be uh, a rapid accumulation of seroma fluid, for example, uh, or lymph fluid or pus in the first hour or two. Um, it often presents with pain uh, due to the, the stretching uh, of the anterior neck, um, as well as with anxiety. The patient will uh, become increasingly anxious, feeling like they uh, are short of breath, um, up to and including not being able to handle their own secretions, uh, their own saliva. And um, this may, in some uh, respects, happen even without a real, true, visible hematoma. It's unlikely that you can't see anything, but um, the, the, the sensation of the stretching and the pain is often more marked uh, than the actual uh, external appearance. Um, the, uh, and I'll show some graphs about this, but essentially uh, the risk period for these is, is uh, within the first uh, couple to 12 hours. Um, it can extend out really uh, to even 23 or 24 hours. Uh, that's the rationale for a lot of uh, thyroid surgeons, including myself, mostly keeping patients overnight for a 23-hour or 24-hour observation stay. Uh, I will say that um, more and more my thyroid lobectomies go home uh, the same day as the operative day but without an overnight stay. Um, these become uh, an issue because uh, um, the hematoma can uh, start to compress the airway and uh, the patient can become hypoxic uh, and arrest from an airway obstruction. Um, we're not worried about uh, acute blood loss anemia um, or someone bleeding to death. It's really due to airway obstruction. Um, and at the point where you're starting to have significant uh, uh, airway obstruction uh, is when you need uh, um, truly emergent uh, or very urgent uh, operative evacuation uh, even at the bedside um, uh, or other location if you can't get back to the operating room in time. Um, so this is just an image of what a small uh, neck hematoma looks like. Um, uh, here you can see uh, the uh, scar and what you're seeing, uh, or the incision, pardon me, since this is pretty acute, uh, what you're seeing is this, this swelling here around it. And depending upon how much pressure, depending on the timing, uh, depending on how soft, you may or may not need to take this uh, individual back to the operating room versus some observation. As far as the timing, there was one very nice study that uh, uh, came out of uh, the Mayo Clinic in uh, 2001, so uh, really now almost considered old in the literature, uh, but really looked at the uh, rate of uh, hematomas um, over the course of about uh, 24 hours. Um, this was a retrospective study that really looked at about a 24-year um, period at Mayo Clinic uh, back in the late 1970s to, two, to 2000 uh, and looked at uh, about 13,800 cases um, of uh, uh, thyroid surgery uh, and they identified uh, 42 hematomas. So first of all, that gives you a rate of only about 0.3% um, and that's uh, a very reasonable rate. I, it's less than the 1% I quoted before, but that's a reasonable rate for a high volume uh, thyroid surgeon or thyroid surgical center, uh, of which Mayo Clinic certainly is. Um, and you can see the breakdown. Uh, nearly half of them are, are occurring uh, in the six hour uh, mark, uh, the, most of them that are less than 24 hours. There are a few that do uh, trickle out beyond 24 hours. And I myself have only had um, two that I can think of that were uh, significantly late, um, both sort of uh, close to uh, and one of them was due to um, uh, actually uh, the patient's partner strangling her. Uh, this was someone who had uh, a neck operation and um, uh, he attempted to strangle her, which led to her uh, presenting to the emergency department and then going to the operating room and his presenting to jail. Um, uh, the other one was uh, a very violent cough, which led to uh, a acute bleed, um, which uh, likely was due to a uh, rupture of a small uh, superior thyroid artery pseudoaneurysm. Um, but uh, otherwise, these are usually small venous or arterial bleeds that occur within the first 24 hours. As surgeons, we often like to blame essentially everybody else um, for anything that goes wrong. 
Um, uh, but uh, this study actually very nicely uh, uh, looked at um, some common things that we uh, uh, blame our hematomas on. Uh, so coughing, especially immediate peri uh, intubation or extubation period, uh, emesis, um, or uh, elevated systolic pressures. Uh, and really there was, uh, while the numbers are small, there was no statistical significance. So um, uh, honestly, uh, as, as thyroid surgeons, we have to say that uh, the postoperative hematomas are really technical uh, in nature uh, and not uh, in fact due to uh, the anesthesiology team uh, uh, not uh, um, prophylaxing against cough or uh, nausea and emesis. Um, when one thinks about uh, hematomas, obviously it gets back to, and I mentioned it's a, we have to assume it's a technical issue, uh, how are we um, dealing with the multiple uh, tiny blood vessels? The thyroid is an extraordinarily vascular uh, gland, and um, uh, certainly the traditional uh, mode of hemostasis uh, and uh, control of vessels was clamping and tying them with whether your your uh, suture choice was silk uh, or others. Um, uh, there has been uh, advances with surgical clips, and these are a variety of pictures of different sizes of clips for different vessels, uh, keeping in mind that many of the vessels that we are tying uh, or are ligating um, or otherwise securing are quite small, um, uh, probably in the order of less than a millimeter, uh, as they are secondary and tertiary branches off of the inferior thyroid artery or superior thyroid artery. Um, more and more, though, uh, we do a lot of our uh, surgery, uh, and in my hands, especially when we are uh, distant uh, from the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, with electrosurgery, and there's different devices. This is a picture of a ligature, and this is a picture of a harmonic scalpel, which really just uses different forms of electrical energy, uh, be it uh, electricity or be it uh, rapid vibration and ultrasonic uh, energy uh, to lead to vessel coagulation. There has uh, been any studies that have shown uh, differences in hematoma rates uh, uh, dependent upon the uh, method of hemostasis. Uh, certainly some of these are quicker than others and that is the reason many of us have adopted using um, electrosurgical techniques versus the clamp and tie um, for much of our operation, but um, there is not a difference in the hematoma rate itself. The second complication that uh, happens with thyroid surgery uh, is hypoparathyroidism. Uh, um, there is the surgical thyroidectomy, um, uh, usually it would have to be a total thyroidectomy or a ultimate completion if it's a two-stage operation. Uh, is, is far and away the most common etiology for hypoparathyroidism. Um, while there are autoimmune conditions for hypoparathyroidism uh, or, or uh, embryologic um, uh, variants, this would, uh, the most common is, is thyroid surgeons causing hypoparathyroidism. Um, and while many times we would think, well, it requires removing them, uh, you can certainly just devascularize the parathyroids and that can lead to uh, dysfunction of those glands. Um, how you define hypoparathyroidism uh, really impacts the uh, incidence and prevalence of hypoparathyroidism after thyroid surgery. Um, and so uh, you can define it based on the use of calcium as uh, in, in a series. You can define it as actual uh, laboratory measurements of calcium. You can define it as laboratory measurements of parathyroid hormone. You can define it as um, uh, symptoms requiring uh, um, either calcium supplementation or checking of labs. And you'll find in the literature all of those, and clearly, as you can imagine, by that varied definition, you're going to have varied rates. I mean, for example, every total thyroidectomy I do, um, I put them prophylactically on calcium. And so if, you're, if your definition of hypoparathyroidism was the use of calcium in a retrospective series, I have 100% of my patients um, uh, having hypoparathyroidism. Uh, I also check calciums postoperatively. And so that too, if that was your definition, would alter it. So you will see wide ranges, um, especially for transient hypoparathyroidism, which is defined as less than six months um, uh, of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, 
of really one to five percent, no, excuse me, one to 15 percent. Um, uh, in general, a number I think that's reasonable to quote to patients is sort of two to five percent. Um, the uh, rate of permanent hypoparathyroidism, which is defined as over six months and uh, usually needing calcium and vitamin D supplementation, rocaltrol supplementation, uh, it, again, centers around the 1%. You'll see 0.5 up to 1.5%. And sometimes, in, again, in lower volume thyroid surgeons, you'll see higher rates. But um, uh, this uh, 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 rate of about 1% is, is, the, is the rate, I think, to quote. Um, Certainly, anytime you're doing a, a neck operation where the vascular supply um, uh, of, in, uh, of the parathyroid is at risk, you have risk for hypoparathyroidism. Uh, but in your reoperative settings where you're doing a concurrent uh, central neck lymphadenectomy for thyroid cancer, um, if there's thyroiditis, whether it's hyperthyroidism or graves or hypothyroidism like Hashimoto's, um, or it's been borne out for, uh, just for thyroid malignancy in general, um, those increase your risk of hypoparathyroidism. Um, I think we have some trainees on, on the uh, call here. Um, it's always a little more difficult in this setting, um, so I, uh, I, I won't uh, um, actually pick on anybody, um, but this is a classic picture uh, of uh, Trousseau's sign, uh, the carpal pedal spasm uh, that you can uh, get uh, when you're uh, inflating a blood pressure cuff uh, due to hypocalcemia. Um, so this is a classic sign of hypocalcemia uh, and hypoparathyroidism. Um, the other one being Schwastik sign, which is the hyperreactivity of your facial nerve upon tapping. Um, so how do we avoid hypoparathyroidism during the operation, both uh, for um, primary and reoperative thyroid surgery, and, and, and especially in those settings, again, that I mentioned, the thyroiditis, the malignancy, the reoperative setting, or the um, uh, lymphadenectomy, uh, which are all uh, raise your risk. Uh, it starts with knowledge of, of the anatomy, and knowledge of where the parathyroids typically lie, um, knowledge of what their blood supply is, which uh, even for the upper parathyroids is mostly from uh, terminal branches of the inferior thyroid artery. Um, uh, occasionally, the upper parathyroid glands either have a primary or a secondary blood supply off of the superior thyroid artery, uh, but uh, in general, we're, we're basing it off the inferior thyroid artery. Um, so knowledge of where that blood vessel is uh, entering the parathyroid, um, uh, knowledge of where the parathyroids might be, and certainly knowledge of what they look like. We also uh, proceed, uh, uh, for thyroid surgery with a capsular dissection, which means staying high on the thyroid capsule um, and uh, sweeping any adherent uh, structures like the parathyroids off of the thyroid. Again, if you are staying right on the thyroid capsule, uh, you should not uh, interfere with the blood supply of the parathyroids. However, um, using parathyroid autografting and transplantation liberally if you think that you uh, devascularized or incidentally removed a parathyroid uh, is certainly encouraged. Um, there are many groups that will routinely do that uh, with a central neck dissection uh, for thyroid cancer so that you can feel like you have at least one known parathyroid uh, that is uh, out of harm's way. Um, uh, and that gets to the final point on the slide here, which is treat every parathyroid as if it's your last one. Um, uh, because even if you say, well, I can sacrifice this uh, parathyroid um, uh, because the other ones are okay, you can't make that assumption. Um, there are some emerging technologies with uh, using fluorescent dyes uh, like methylene blue or fluorescence imaging using something called SPI technology to try to uh, ensure uh, perfusion of your parathyroid glands during your thyroid surgery. This is not something that I personally have adopted. Um, uh, it is tried somewhat, but uh, you will find mixed results um, uh, in part because of the uh, uh, diffusion of these dyes to surrounding lymph nodes and other things that uh, becomes quite uh, difficult to actually uh, interpret your imaging sometimes. Um, 
Many people, especially if you're considering same-day discharge, will uh, actually check a post-operative PTH level uh, to ensure that uh, there is uh, adequate function of their parathyroids. And we'll certainly, uh, we certainly use this for parathyroid primary surgery uh, to see if you have um, uh, brought your hyperparathyroidism down to a curative level. We, in here, we're using it to make sure that the PTH is not too low. Um, uh, this certainly is not, is not being used, or we can't use it uh, during the operation primarily to prevent injury, so it is just more predictive and may allow some who use uh, selective uh, initiation of calcium or rocaltrol post-op uh, to do that uh, and potentially watch someone overnight um, uh, for, to see the, the trend of their calcium levels versus sending them home on the same day. Um, I will, if I am considering sending someone home from a total thyroidectomy on the same day, which I uh, tend to do more with uh, children uh, than even adults, uh, I'd rather get them out of the hospital, the children out of the hospital on the same day, I will check a post-operative PTH. Um, I do use it uh, more liberally also in uh, Graves disease surgery where um, uh, there's a known uh, increased risk of hypoparathyroidism, so uh, I would rather uh, be um, um, adding rocaltrol sooner, potentially even on post-operative day zero, than waiting until post-operative day one. Uh, there is certainly a cost of checking a parathyroid level, uh, depending on where we are in our probably in the neighborhood of about one hundred and eighty, one hundred and ninety dollars or so. The last time I looked at it, so um, uh, you don't want to just uh, add lab tests uh, unless you're going to make a change in your therapy. Um, as far as uh, treatment of hypoparathyroidism, uh, this is uh, certainly uh, something that uh, is very familiar to this uh, endocrine group that I'm talking to now, so uh, I'll go over this somewhat quickly, but um, I, like I mentioned, I, I put all of my uh, patients who all of their parathyroids are at risk, i.e. the total thyroidectomy, I put them prophylactically on calcium, and I usually start with a dose of 500 milligrams three times a day. Um, uh, uh, so I will put them prophylactically, but if they certainly, if they're hypoparathyroid uh, or hypocalcemic I, uh, with symptoms, I will uh, uh, start them on um, uh, upwards of 1,500 milligrams uh, three times a day. Uh, are M&Ms really high in calcium? Uh, probably, uh, especially if they're milk chocolate ones versus the dark chocolate ones. Um, uh, when someone is hypoparathyroid uh, and it is not controlled uh, sufficiently with uh, calcium uh, alone, then the next step certainly would be to add uh, calcium, uh, excuse me, calcitriol or rocaltrol. Uh, again, the, the activation um, of the, uh, uh, with a conversion, excuse me, to the active form of vitamin D, the 125 dihydroxy is PTH dependent. So if you're um, going to be dependent on uh, 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D uh, for calcium absorption. Uh, you can't just give them uh, ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol uh, in the uh, surgically hypoparathyroid uh, state. Um, so that's why we use calcitriol. So I'll often start with 0.5 or 1 microgram twice a day, depending on what the calcium is, uh, and titrate up from there. Uh, certainly, I'll, I'll add magnesium, uh, IV, as well as oral to try to help uh, their uh, repletion of their hypocalcemia. If all of this is not enough, I will usually start uh, by adding a, uh, a, a low-dose thiazide diuretic uh, to help uh, 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 prevent urine calcium losses. So I'll usually just start with 12 and a half milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide, sometimes up to 25. Um, Though I mentioned before that PTH certainly is necessary for conversion of your 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, if someone is significantly hypo uh, vitamin or have significant hypovitaminosis D, I will give them a one-time 50,000 unit dose of vitamin D itself. Um, if they're an inpatient, uh, which depending on the severity, they might either be still an inpatient from their primary surgery or readmitted uh, if this uh, arose a couple of days post-op. Um, you can use intermittent or continuous calcium gluconate um, while your oral supplementation uh, is uh, kicking in. 
Um, when uh, all of that fails is when I'll consult endocrinology, not knowing that I have used a lot of our tricks already, uh, but that's when I'm uh, reaching out for uh, assistance. Um, and so uh, usually when I've uh, consulted uh, uh, this group for uh, the management of hypoparathyroidism post-op, I'll have had all these things in place um, and then we're, uh, we're going to have to figure out together what the next best step is. Uh, and whether that's nat para or something else like that, but again, that that may some uh, the injectable parathyroid hormones are going to be uh, months down the line from a uh, insurance approval and and proof that these methods uh, don't work and that they actually have uh, um, permanent hypoparathyroidism. A big and sort of scary for the patient, scary for the surgeon risk is injuries to the nerves. Um, so when people have uh, voice changes post parathyroidectomy, um, uh, it's not that there's been primary injury to the vocal folds themselves, although occasionally, uh, if you have a very invasive thyroid cancer, it can actually invade through the uh, uh, laryngeal cartilage itself. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, it's going to be a nerve or a neural injury that will uh, lead to changes in voice and swallowing and breathing. The most commonly injured nerve is actually the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, which runs up near the superior pole of the thyroid gland, uh, sort of intertwined with the um, uh, branches of the superior thyroid artery. That's actually the most commonly injured nerve. Uh, this uh, will lead to changes in tensioning of the vocal cord and is most noticed by those who are um, you know, uh, singers, especially for their vocation as well as for their avocation. So this is what's known as the opera singer's nerve. Um, the, the nerve that tends to get a lot of attention as far as uh, fear of injury is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, also known as the inferior laryngeal nerve. Um, and uh, again, uh, the uh, Injury rate uh, during thyroid surgery varies in the literature, and some of it depends on how you look at it. Um, I, I will uh, admit that the otolaryngology literature probably cites a little bit higher rate than the general surgical literature, um, and that is not because that the otolaryngology thyroid surgeons are worse at what they do. I think uh, they're, uh, they were very early adopters of post-operative um, uh, flexible laryngoscopy and uh, uh, other modes of looking at the uh, vocal fold motion and may actually pick up much more subtle uh, dysfunction than, than uh, um, your uh, general surgeon who may say, how's your voice? And if the patient says, okay, we assume there's no nerve injury. Um, similar to the hypoparathyroidism, uh, there are a uh, breakdown of transient and permanent nerve injuries. Uh, they uh, time point again is six months. Uh, the transient nerve injury rate you'll see quartered anywhere from one to ten percent, with a permanent nerve injury rate of about a half to one percent. Um, I mentioned before the external branch uh, um, and how it uh, intertwines with the superior thyroid artery, which is what I've just shown here, and this is the superior pole of the thyroid. Um, so there's a classification schema. The vast majority. Uh, of these um, are type one, where it uh, either doesn't go within the branches or wraps around uh, the superior thyroid artery before it has really given off any of its major branches. Um, there's a type 2A, where the nerve either from the anterior or the posterior comes between uh, the uh, branching, uh, the first major branching of the superior thyroid artery. Um, and then much less common is type 2B, where it's really at the from the anterior posterior aspect through the secondary branching. It is these which are really at risk, even as you're trying to stay right on the capsule of the thyroid, um, you can actually injure uh, this external branch. Uh, I mentioned already really uh, the, the functional deficits from the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve injury. Um, uh, we do not routinely use nerve monitoring to uh, check this nerve, although it can be done, and I will go into a little bit about nerve monitoring in a moment. The recurrent laryngeal nerve injury um, is really what gives me the greatest amount of anxiety. I spend a lot of the time during the operation looking for this nerve and protecting it. Um, it has uh, no redundancy in its function. There is one on each side, and, and there is not uh, a lot of uh, um, backup to its function. Um, and 
and uh, injury can happen instantaneously uh, just by squeezing it or a, a, an errant clip or tie, uh, even if you've checked. Um, there are times we do intentionally uh, sacrifice this nerve, and usually that's uh, for uh, known malignancies. Uh, and that, uh, I will say, having done that uh, several times, it is uh, emotionally taxing to intentionally sacrifice it, but uh, you would do that in order to um, uh, fully uh, remove a, a cancer. Um, and uh, hopefully that kind of a discussion would be had with the patient preoperatively. From some anatomy for the recurrent nerve, so this is looking at the lateral side of the right lobe of the thyroid. Um, so head is up here, this is the thyroid cartilage, here's the trachea, and here is the right thyroid lobe with the inferior and superior parathyroid glands. Um, traditionally, the nerve um, crosses in the tracheoesophageal groove, so here's trachea, the esophagus is back here. Uh, it'll uh, recur and then come up the tracheoesophageal groove um, posterior to the uh, 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 inferior thyroid artery uh, and also posterior to this what's called the tubercle of zupercondylar lateral outpouching of the thyroid uh, prior to heading into the cricothyroid muscle under here. Uh, there are some variants of course where it comes anterior to the thyroid but posterior uh, or intertwined with uh, some of these tiny branches of the inferior thyroid artery. Um, this is uh, certainly a higher risk for injury. I'll also mention that this point right here um, is where the nerve is most fixed, whereas you might have a little give. If you're pulling the thyroid, this nerve can move up and down. This is really where it's most fixed and is at risk for injury. Um, when you injure a unilateral um, nerve, you get uh, dysfunction of one of the vocal folds. Uh, you can often have some breathing difficulty, but not uh, entirely because the contralateral vocal fold will be able to a B duct completely, and you can still have enough tracheal uh, opening to breathe, but the patient may sense some breathing issues. Uh, the bigger issue is going to be swallowing uh, because you will have this, what's called a glottic gap, uh, as this cord here, you can see this is the uh, right vocal fold, uh, is much thinner, it's more um, uh, atrophic than the left, and it doesn't fully come to midline, so you have this glottic gap. Food and liquids and secretions can penetrate uh, the uh, trachea at this point, um, and that leads to some coughing with swallowing, um, but also because you don't have the two vocal folds opposing each other well here, you will get some um, you know, uh, air escaping and a very hoarse voice or a breathy type of voice. Bilateral um, uh, often leads to this, a tracheostomy. If not, neither vocal fold can really open well, then you tend to uh, be short of breath, uh, uh, up to the point of needing a tracheostomy. Uh, you might be able to talk okay because the cords are near each other and may be able to vibrate, but it's not going to be a normal voice, but you'll also run out of uh, breath pretty quickly. So how do we avoid injury to the nerve? Uh, again, knowledge of anatomy, including all of those variants. Um, I mentioned here non-recurrent nerves. Occasionally, in a, in a couple percent at most, um, the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, does not recur. It sometimes it is associated with uh, vascular anomalies. Um, and so there's no, on the left, aortic arch, or on the right, the subclavian um, vessel that drags it down to recur. So it comes directly uh, off of the vagus nerve, uh, posterior to the carotid sheath, and goes directly into the cricothyroid um, uh, uh, muscle. And if you don't know that that is a potential variant, you could injure this uh, uh, structure that uh, crosses po uh, transversely in the posterior central neck on either the left or the right side. It is more common that you're going to have a non-recurrent nerve on the right than the left, um, but still they're overall pretty uncommon. It helps to certainly uh, uh, do your dissection in a very bloodless field, so hemostasis is exceptionally important uh, to avoid nerve injuries. I like to identify the nerve in every case. Um, uh, and if it's a reoperative case, try to identify it in a previously unoperated field so that I can actually uh, trace the nerve. Um, I find it easy to identify the nerve well uh, low in the neck, um, below the inferior thyroid artery, and then follow it up. Um, once I see it, I try to always keep it in view, and I also then switch. I mentioned before we use some electrical surgical uh, dissectors. Once I know where the nerve is um, and I'm working around that nerve, no longer use electrical dissection so that uh, I can avoid any potential um, uh, spread or spark to that nerve uh, causing either
temporary or permanent injury. Uh, that's when I'll switch to using ties or clips. Um, intraoperative nerve monitoring or neural monitoring allows us to check the function of the nerve. Um, so this is a, a stylized diagram here um, showing uh, the recurrent uh, mm -hmm. laryngeal nerve um, uh, going in to the uh, left uh, cricothyroid muscle around here. And so we can stimulate the recurrent or if we can open up the carotid sheath and stimulate the vagus, which is uh, where the recurrent nerve comes off of and check the integrity of that nerve and its ability to um, be depolarized with an electrical signal and carry that signal through to cause muscular contraction, which would be essentially uh, detected by um, pads or electrical detection on the endotracheal tube or built into the endotracheal tube, which essentially does an EMG or an electromyogram of the vocal fold muscles. Um, that does require the patient to not be uh, paralyzed or uh, uh, during the operation. Um, so uh, it adds a challenge for our anesthesiology colleagues, but allows us to say at the end of the operation that they will in fact um, uh, be uh, uh, intact from a vocal fold function. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, nerve injuries. Uh, the largest to date that I know of uh, is actually now, gosh, only 15, 16 years old, was a study out of Germany that looked at uh, uh, 16,448 operations uh, with a total of uh, literally just shy of 30,000 nerves at risk, and we'll hear that in the literature a bunch, uh, that phrase nerves at risk, um, and um, uh, uh, begs the question why they didn't include one more total thyroidectomy to get up to 30,000 nerves, uh, but the overall permanent injury rate was 0.84%, uh, which is, uh, I think, still reproducible and something that we do uh, uh, continue to talk about. Um, they looked at the data by how the operation was done, by the volume of the number of operations and, and how it was managed. Um, and uh, some of the uh, risk factors that uh, would be ones that you would probably not be surprised by, uh, if this was recurrent disease or reoperative setting, um, uh, that risk, raised the risk of nerve injury. Um, almost five times if it's recurrent for benign disease, like a multinodular goiter, but almost seven times if it was recurrent for a reoperative thyroid cancer. Um, on your initial operation, that cancer operations already raise the uh, risk of a nerve injury. Um, if you're doing a complete lobectomy, which arguably you should always be doing, um, uh, that raise the risk by about uh, to an odds ratio of 1.8. Um, if you routinely didn't identify nerves and say, well, there's no way I injured the nerve because I didn't see it, that in my mind doesn't fly uh, and the, the data don't support it either. You have a uh, uh, 1.4 uh, odds ratio if you don't routinely identify the nerve. And there is a slightly higher risk for lower volume surgeons. And so this is a number that has been uh, propagated forward, about 45 nerves at risk. So we're talking about technically 45 lobectomies or 20 or so total thyroidectomies for the definition of what is a, a high volume uh, surgeon uh, in this field. Uh, nerve monitoring did not change the overall risk of nerve injury, somewhat surprisingly. It did allow you to detect, but didn't change the risk of the injury. Um, uh, it did actually, though, uh, help with the lower volume surgeon. So someone who does not do this very often may absolutely want to include this adjunct technology to try to uh, improve the safety profile of their operation. What to do if you have a nerve injury? If you detect it, um, uh, th there's not a ton that you can do. Um, you can do a direct neurography or a neural repair. Um, and this is a, uh, a photo from underneath a microscope uh, that where you're often doing these, where they're going to do a direct end-to-end -end anastomosis. Sometimes a section has been removed and you can't do that. So you can do a graft from ansa cervicalis or other nerves. Um, the, the, the frustrating part of this nerve is though it contains uh, multiple uh, AB and AD ductor fibers and you will never uh, get them all aligned. So what you're doing and what's shown over here on the right side is an epineural repair and that will allow there to be some uh, um, anti-grade uh, conduction through this nerve that will generally allow there to be some tension uh, and um, uh, in, the, in the muscles, which will prevent some atrophy, but it will uh, uh, unlike, unlikely to ever recreate all of the um, 
motion, both AB and AD duction that is necessary. Um, so uh, just sewing it back together is not going to really uh, recreate functional uh, vocal folds, but it may um, uh, lessen some of the symptomatology in the long run. Um, when you do this, it does help uh, uh, more than if you don't. Uh, however, depending upon the nerve injury, you may not have the two ends to actually do this neurography, uh, but there have been studies that clearly have shown that um, uh, if you are able to, it, it is probably worth it. A newer therapy that uh, I've used uh, once, I know it's uh, uh, propagated by some of the uh, laryngologists, is the use of a specific calcium channel blocker called nemotapine. Um, and this, uh, uh, there's been some uh, basic science as well as clinical data on the use of nemotapine uh, for uh, improving the recovery of purposeful motion in an acutely injured recurrent nerve. Um, so it's certainly a, it's an available a drug. It's been around for a while for hypertension. Uh, it's used in neurosurgical uh, and neurologic uh, patient populations uh, to reduce vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but there's experimental evidence that it does reduce neural cell death or neuronal death by apoptosis, uh, and it increases um, some of the axonal sprouting uh, by protecting and propagating growth cones uh, within injured nerves. So there was, uh, there's good supportive uh, um, uh, uh, animal model and cellular model uh, that this uh, could help. Um, so it has been used in uh, humans uh, and in uh, clinically for uh, injured um, uh, cranial nerves uh, related to neurosurgical procedures. Uh, so um, there is, again, some uh, data to support its use. Uh, it's a calcium channel blocker, um, so it's the thought uh, that it might uh, uh, work through that mechanism, uh, but it also seems to uh, increase the number of available acetylcholine receptors, um, and, uh, as well as uh, it has a central nervous system effect as well uh, on something called preventing reorganization of somatotopical rearrangements within the nucleus ambiguous. Um, When it has been studied, and there's been a, a couple uh, more recent studies in the last couple of years, really, uh, um, you actually definitely saw some improved purposeful vocal fold motion, uh, upwards of three or four times uh, historic controls. Uh, it still takes a good 10 weeks or so before you get uh, function. Um, so oftentimes when you're using this drug, you're going to have be on there for two to three months. Uh, generally, you're putting them on uh, 30 to 60 milligrams three times a week, again, for uh, two to three months. Um, your goal is to start it right away if possible, uh, but uh, because it is an antihypertensive, you have to watch their uh, blood pressure and uh, you might have to titrate the dosage for hypotension, drowsiness, and dizziness. Um, what else can we do? Uh, speech therapy uh, will help. Um, uh, there's also some temporary or permanent vocal fold injections, which will help uh, medialize uh, the vocal fold, especially if you're having problems with uh, aspiration. Um, uh, there are permanent uh, injections that you can do as well. And then there's uh, uh, laryngeal framework surgery that medializes the whole vocal uh, fold to help with voice uh, quality. Um, another very important complication is the, what the scar looks like. Uh, and this is something that patients ask me about often. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, it, it's, it's not just a vanity thing. It has to do also with how the, uh, the thoughtfulness of where the incision was placed, how it's closed. Um, and uh, the endocrine surgery site actually through UCLA has a very nice scar gallery, uh, which I borrowed some of these from, um, and uh, as well as some of my own pictures. But um, uh, certainly you can have irregular scars that look like they might have had some clips on it. Uh, versus a very nice faint scar. So I, I do include that in, in the complications of thyroid surgery. Um, certainly other complications for thyroid surgery include disease recurrence, thyroid storm, hypothyroidism, uh, uh, lymph leaks, tracheal injuries, esophageal injuries, uh, and even sympathetic chain injury. So I'm not going to go into all of these uh, from a time perspective. Um, if you do a central neck dissection uh, to remove um, uh, known or, or prophylactically suspected even um, uh, positive lymph nodes in, in uh, 
differentiated uh, thyroid cancer or medullary thyroid cancer, um, uh, you will increase your complication rate, especially as far as nerve injury and parathyroid injury. Um, so that's a big reason that there's a controversy over the routine application of central neck dissections. Um, just for sake of time, I'm actually going to skip uh, some of these. If you move to the lateral neck, um, uh, which we apply for clearance of malignant nodal disease, uh, there are a whole other set of structures that could be in, uh, injured, including uh, things like the uh, thoracic duct, the brachial plexus, um, the uh, vagus nerve, the um, spinal accessory nerve. Um, and so this leads to a number of potential um, uh, injuries and morbidity that you have to talk to your patients about. Um, there's also in the lateral neck your, your great vessels. Uh, it would be pretty uncommon that the, the carotid is injured, but certainly the internal jugular vein could be injured uh, or uh, because of retraction or, or need for venorophy. If there's tumor uh, associated with the wall of the internal jugular vein, you could wind up with a, a clot or a thrombus uh, in the uh, IJ itself. Um, I do want to move to some of the other uh, organs and glands. Parathyroid, um, uh, the reason I, I, I spend most of my time on thyroid is many of the complications are really pretty much the same. Um, and you will see this list, which is again from the parathyroidectomy consent, is essentially the same thing uh, as the thyroid um, uh, informed consent. Uh, I do add specifically, uh, though, the inability to find all the overactive parathyroid tissue, uh, because there are times that you uh, do a parathyroid exploration and, and are uh, unsuccessful at uh, uh, finding the parathyroid adenoma. Um, so a minimally invasive parathyroidectomy is where you're uh, uh, really limiting your dissection. And the, uh, so the risk of a hematoma is pretty small uh, because your dissection field is very small. Um, so most people, including me, send uh, these folks home the same day and do not keep them overnight because the, the risk of uh, hematoma is, is negligible. Um, there is certainly a risk after parathyroid surgery, and part of it is related to just the hormonal changes um, of having hypoparathyroidism. Some of it is because we may have removed too much parathyroid tissue, and some of it is uh, truly because of uh, suppression of the remaining glands or because of hungry bone syndrome and, and uh, really uh, pulling calcium into uh, the bone um, uh, due to increased osteoblastic activity. Uh, we use the same time frame for temporary and permanent hypoparathyroidism uh, as it relates to parathyroid surgery, as we did for thyroid surgery, and that's six months um, after parathyroid surgery, the rate of temporary hypoparathyroidism, you'll see anywhere from 2 to 15%. And once again, it has to do with exactly how it's defined for permanent hypoparathyroidism. Um, it does center a little bit near that 1% that I mentioned before. Um, as I started to, to mention, when you're doing a parathyroid exploration, if you're doing just a one gland excision, you might have uh, suppression of the remaining glands. Uh, uh, as well, you might have some hungry bones, and we do see that, um, uh, especially in the elderly patients or those with significant osteoporosis or elevated alkafos and other burn, bone turnover markers preoperatively. Um, and really what that is, it's hypocalcemia. It's not really hypoparathyroidism. And in fact, if you're checking uh, PTH, oftentimes it's elevated, and it could look like you were non-curative, but if it's elevated PTH in the setting of hypocalcemia, then hungry bones is really just hypocalcemia and, and not hypoparathyroidism. Um, during a parathyroid exploration, especially if you have to do a bilateral neck exploration, you may in fact um, uh, devascularize some of the remaining uh, non-pathologic tissue, uh, and that uh, can lead to hypoparathyroidism. Um, if you know you have a foregland disease process, such as um, uh, uh, MEN1 or, or even in secondary hyperparathyroidism, and you're, you're removing three and a half or, or, or close to that as far as glands, if you leave a too small of a functional remnant, then you can have hypoparathyroidism. Um, avoidance of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, very much uh, parallels what I talked about for thyroid surgery. It has to do with identifying uh, the glands, being cautious around them, uh, really only removing abnormal glands, uh, and using frozen section to confirm uh, that what you're looking at is parathyroid or not parathyroid. Um, 
Uh, the use of intraoperative hormone monitoring does allow you to know when a, a parathyroid operation has uh, met its uh, desired completion, uh, to know that there has been a drop and normalization of parathyroid hormone. Um, so we do use that as, uh, uh, pretty routinely. Uh, parathyroid transplantation and or cryopreservation uh, is used uh, when there's uh, um, for gland disease, especially, and you're potentially uh, taking all the parathyroid tissue uh, out. This is the cryopreservation so that you have another opportunity to do a transplant uh, should your uh, immediate transplant uh, fail. Parathyroid autografting works very nicely because each of the parathyroid cells is essentially its own little factory, um, and so it just needs a blood supply so it can sense calcium and release uh, uh, parathyroid hormone. Um, uh, so what we do is we uh, take the vascularized parathyroid tissue and mince it and put it into a well-vascularized muscle, often the brachial radialis in the arm, but it can go uh, into the neck as well, to, for example, into the um, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, I do not graft abnormal parathyroid tissue into the neck. So if I'm uh, doing a parathyroid autograft for a patient who has four gland parathyroid disease, I will transplant it into the arm uh, so that a subsequent potential operation, if your graft becomes hyperfunctional, uh, can be done much simpler in the arm. That parathyroid graft takes about 10 weeks to ingraft uh, and to start working. So until that happens, if that is your only viable parathyroid tissue, you will. Uh, or your patient will have pretty dense hypoparathyroidism. Uh, again, I always try to treat every parathyroid gland as if it's the last one. So if I'm uh, uh, taking out a parathyroid I, or one gets removed incidentally, I will transplant it. Um, the goal, if this is your only parathyroid tissue, would be to uh, transplant a volume or mass of parathyroid tissue of about uh, 40 to 50 milligrams. Um, and this is just a, a, a diagram of parathyroid transplantation into the uh, forearm, and we tend to put them into little individual pockets here. Um, a primarily transplanted uh, tissue will work about 90 uh, to 95 percent of the time if you're doing it from a cryopreserved piece. Uh, so, a secondarily, that's a, your your uh, take rate will drop to 60 to 65 percent. Um, in cryopreservation, it's really what it sounds like. We freeze it at minus 80, um, uh, and then that's actually transferred into liquid nitrogen. Um, uh, here, our protocol is after about two years, we get rid of it. Um, however, uh, really, you'll know well by six months if they have permanent hypoparathyroidism or not. Parathyroidectomy has a historical failure rate of about 4 to 10 percent. That has dropped to about 1 percent with the advent and use of intraoperative parathyroid hormone. So parathyroidectomy is really a very successful operation, uh, again, in someone who has a high volume of parathyroid surgery. Um, I mentioned these uh, persistent and uh, recurrent uh, um, hype or, or, or definitions for hypoparathyroidism. And for transient nerve injury, we use that same six months for persistent and permanent um, uh, uh, recurrence. So, uh, excuse me, for, for, for persistent or recurrent hyperparathyroidism. So if you have recurrent uh, or laboratories supporting uh, elevated calcium and elevated PTH within six months of your operation, we have to assume that there was a failure to find all the causative uh, adenomas um, or recognize hyperplasia, and so we call that persistent disease. If your labs are normal and it's after six months, then we do think that it's possible that you developed a metachronous lesion. Um, and, and so six months is a, is a number to remember, certainly for endocrine surgery, for transient versus permanent um, complications, but also for persistent versus recurrent hyperparathyroidism. Um, I mentioned intraoperative PTH, and that works beautifully because parathyroid hormone has only a half-life of about four or five minutes. Um, uh, the assay itself takes 20 to 30 minutes, um, uh, so it does add some time to the operation, but has allowed for that drop uh, in the um, uh, recurrence uh, or persistence rates down to about 1%. Um, here we do it centrally, meaning that send the specimen to the lab uh, from the OR versus doing it right at the, uh, the bedside. There are some platforms where you can do it right in the OR. Um, 
the goal or the reason that we want to try to uh, prevent reoperations is certainly the persistent uh, disease leads to disease specific sequelae for the patients, uh, but there's also a cost, and this is now a, a 25 year old study, but um, uh, the, uh, so the costs have probably gone up since then, but um, uh, looking at the cost of reoperations. Um, uh, showed that there was an over two-fold difference uh, in the overall cost management for those who had unsuccessful primary parathyroid operations versus needing a reoperation. Um, based on actually just the time here, uh, which we're almost at the end of the hour, I think I'm going to hold on talking too much about adrenalectomy. Um, happy to come back and do that another time, but I, I do want to see if there are uh, questions at all.